Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Chelsea Berger. Myself, Bianca Diaz, Zeta Pacheco, and Caitlin Velsvog were assigned to organize and promote this event through our human trafficking class. We would like to thank the Spartan Nation Liberation Foundation for providing snacks and refreshments following the, before and after the presentation. We would like to thank Set Free for their participation and help in promoting this event. And lastly, we would like to thank the Went Center for providing the funds to make this event possible. This project is supported by the Went Character Initiative, which promotes a campus culture of excellent moral character and purposeful lives characterized by integrity, justice, and compassion. And then please welcome our guests, Ruth Buckles and Brittany Phillips. Okay. You ready? Hi, I hope you can hear me. Anybody can't hear me? Then we're good with the mic. My name is Ruth Buckles, and uh, I would have really liked it if this presentation could be done by one of you sitting in the audience, as opposed to me standing up front. So let me tell you why I'm here and why I do presentations like this, because it's not for the joy of getting to present. In my world, I have been a foster parent since 1988. I was one of those very lucky people who got to be, know my calling very early in life, and helping other people find healing within their families was what I was called to do. And in knowing that, I was aware of some social issues because they were coming into my home at all times. I've had over 90 teenagers in my home and in my family and in my care since 1988 when I became a foster parent. In fostering, there are many, many different exposure things that you get to go through. And so I was one of those that I knew of human trafficking because it happened in third world countries and it was over there. And I didn't have to really worry about it or live with it or face it or really do anything about it. I could just live with my naive little world and think that's somebody else's issue to deal with. Well, in 2008, I got a telephone call from a very good therapist counselor at Toledo. And I know there are people that don't understand, you know, Toledo and all the issues about Toledo, so that isn't a political commercial for Toledo. But they did phenomenal work for the youth that I got to, to parent after they came out of Toledo. And this therapist called me up and she says, hey Ruth, I have a young lady who would like to come into a, a forever family, a family because, you know, she's disconnected from her family. And I said, okay. I'm game for that. And I went and I met her, and I fell in love with her, and that was in June of 2008. The following January 2009, obviously, I got a telephone call, and I am very protective as a parent. So you know how you all treat telemarketers? That's how I treated this person on the telephone when they called me, and they asked for my child by not only her first name, but her last name. And we in foster care, we don't use last names. That's somebody's confidentiality. So of course, I was beyond rude and disrespectful to this person as I then hang, hung up on him. The next telephone call about 10 minutes later came in and it was from a female who again asked for the same child by the first name and a last name. And she says, ma'am, before you hang up on me, I really need to talk to this young lady. She's our witness. And I said, Witness to what? And she says, you don't know why she's in foster care? And I said, she needed a family. And she said, well, yes, yes, ma'am, she did. But she was also trafficked. And you know where, when you hear traumatic information, you know where you were standing, you know what you were wearing, you know every noise that was happening around that kitchen table that I was standing next to? I will never forget that moment. And I looked at my beautiful daughter, and I went, holy cow. And I handed her the phone, and I listened while she talked to the person on the other end. At the end of that call, it was very clear that I had no idea what I was doing, parenting. And I made a resolution at that point. I was become, going to become an expert on human trafficking because my daughter needed a mother, and this mother Needed, it, needed to make sure that at no given point did any other parent in Iowa have to go through that traumatic moment of hearing, you are now parenting somebody who has been trafficked. 
Brittany didn't get to go and testify against this young person that was being, being prosecuted for the activities that he was involved in in regards to her. We made that decision together for two reasons. One, they couldn't keep her safe. They couldn't guarantee her safety, and the prosecutor and the police officer, who was the first telephone call, by the way, I did have to grovel and apologize to him. He is one of our heroes, one of Brittany's heroes. Um, but we didn't go because they said there are people that do not want her to make it to the courthouse alive and willing to testify. And once you get to Illinois, they will be looking. And we decided we can't do that because I couldn't keep her safe. I couldn't hire bodyguards to put around her. And I didn't have enough family at that point that could go and support her, as Brittany was one of the older members of my family at that point. So we made an agreement that from now on, any time we get invited to go speak in Iowa about human trafficking, we are going to do everything we can to keep Iowa youth, Iowa families, Iowa grandparents, Iowa communities as safe as we can make them by doing conversations like this. So we're here to share our experience and our knowledge with you. I don't want you to change because of what we tell you, but I'm going to ask you to do some things in regards to what you do for the people you love as this presentation goes on. I am not here to make you comfortable. And in all honesty, if you leave kind of with that icky feeling in the pit of your stomach, I've done my job. So I just want you to know I'm not here to entertain. I hope I make you uncomfortable. Human trafficking in the United States was identified in the year 2000 with a federal law. Those of you who study that, you know it's out there. You know that we have, we have all kinds of levels of government now involved in recognizing human trafficking. I'm not here to talk about it, but you can go back and look at it. There are three legal elements that go with human trafficking. And I want to talk a little bit about what this is, because this is where you identify where it is in your world. In Iowa, it's thriving because we tend to love and trust everybody. We tend to let everybody have their own business. We tend to glance at people and, and make a quick judgment. We know them, we don't know them. They're our business, they're not our business. We wave, we're very friendly, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't stop, look, and pay attention. And you're gonna need to if you're gonna help in trafficking. So the process is recruiting, harboring, maintaining, or in any way, shape, or form, taking care of or obtaining a human being. The recruiting is what I want to talk about. Recruiters are typically, typically, between the ages of 15 and 25. They are usually young men or women. Yes, men and women are involved. And their job is to get to know their target person very, very well. They might do this in school. They might do this on the internet. They might do this at the local you know, ice cream shop, coffee shop, mall, movie theaters, you name it. Their job is to get to know your young person probably better than you know your young person. And I use young people because they're targeted, specifically by this population, because the buyers of youth being trafficked want them young, want them innocent, because it increases the thrill. So in them recruiting your youth, they're going to things like concerts. They're, they're stalking them on the Facebook. We here in Iowa, I used to do it myself, we put the names of our children on the back of our children because we're very proud of our kids. But do you know how easy it is to stalk somebody's kids? If you know they go to this school and they have that last name, you type them in and you get 50 hits and you get pictures and you get all this. And that's a huge help to these recruiters. And they know more about you, your family, your pets, the siblings, because it's all out there for us to share. And people have no boundaries. And they say to me, Ruth, it's OK. People don't really do that. But if you've ever been interviewed a recruiter, they do that. And they know your kids. They recruit. We know that they're in most middle schools, and we know they're in most high schools. And the reason they recruit is it's a financial gain. Maybe for every human being you bring to me, if I'm the pimp, you bring to me is worth $100. Maybe they're worth $1,000. Maybe they're worth new tires on your car if you need that. Maybe they're worth the drugs that you'd like to be smoking. 
And there are a lot of people in Iowa who will say, oh, we need to legalize marijuana. Yep, don't even get me started, because that's a gateway into this stuff, and boy, do they use that to their advantage. So yay, look, and they think, what can I give this kid? And in the process of what they're giving to this youth that they're trying to recruit into the business, they are saying things like, you know what? If your parents aren't, aren't taking care of you, it, you don't feel heard. You know what? I, I'm checking up on your math scores. I'm taking care of you. I'm right here. You want those new Miss Me jeans or whatever it is out there? I'll get those for you. I'll take care. I'll buy your lunch. I'll do this. I'll do that. And it's kind of a recruiting. It's kind of a dating. Sometimes they'll even say, I'll be your boyfriend. I'll be your girlfriend. I'll be your date to this. I'll be your date to that. And at some given point, when the comfort level is down, and you've seen this person enough, and this person has talked to you or approached you, you lose that stranger danger thought process, and you think you know them. And you end up in a car, or you end up at somebody's house, or you end up in somebody's party that you got invited to. And maybe you go to the bathroom, and maybe you find out you're not alone, and all they really need is a picture of you from the head up because they can put you on any body they want to put you on. There are literally billions of pictures out there. And then the blackmail starts. Most of the time, it's so subtle and it's so quick, you have no idea what you're getting into until they've got you on something that you don't want to be got doing. Make sense? They're called recruiters. There's a whole lot of other derogatory terms that they can go by. Harboring or taking care of, it might be, as you'll hear from Britt a little later, it might be that you're guarding this for them or you're guarding that for them. It might be that you're keeping this safe. Or maybe you're, you're brought in so that you can take care of this person that they're also recruiting. You might come in as a pair, like, I'm going to take my best friend because obviously if I have my wingman with me, I'm safe, right? Well, then I just get two for the price of one if I'm the recruiter. Make sense? And then, of course, all I have to do is keep the blackmail going and the threats and coercion. Force, fraud, and coercion. Exactly what it says. I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to promise you the world. I'm going to maybe follow through on some things that I say I'm going to give you. I might be buying you food, might be buying you clothes, might be buying you airline tickets. I might be traveling with you. Maybe I told you I would take you to Disneyland. Okay? What I didn't tell you is you're going to fund that trip across the country and you're going to be doing approximately 15 tricks a day, to, which is our average number for most of the people that are being trafficked. You know, you're going to be doing that as we travel across the country and we stop at every stop that we can stop at, whether we're at a come and go or whether we're at a truck stop or whether we're at a hotel. I'm going to be marketing you and I'm going to be able to do it on the internet because even as our police force can track it being happening on the internet, we can't tell you which hotel they're going to be at. We can't predict where they're going. Some of these pimps have enough money that they have real estate in multiple cities and multiple places in the trafficked areas that they want to travel, and they just keep different populations in each one. If I'm a good pimp, I'm going to have every hair color, every skin color, every ethnicity. I'm going to have both genders or all gender identities. And if I am lucky enough to have recruited an LGBTQ youth, I can double the money by promising all kinds of sinister things that other human beings can do to that person as they try and convert them back straight. It is the sickest, most disgusting marketing job you'll ever get to read about, and it's all over the place. Force, fraud, or coercion. If for whatever reason, you decide to bulk at anything that I say you're going to do, I am going to do what they did in the 1800s to make sure that the strong African-American men didn't rebel against the plantation owners. You know, how you, you, have, you know how you control a person that's twice as strong as you and probably smarter? Anybody know how to control that person? They did it all the time. You don't threaten the person, because they don't care what you do to them. You threaten the one they love. You take their wife, their woman, their child, their daughter. You can crumble most men really quick by targeting the one they love. And it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that that's how they controlled those plantation workers. 
because if you've ever been on the East Coast, what they had to do in those fields was no easy task. And they had to use some, some extreme measures. Those measures haven't gone away. Same measures, same people, they're crumbling. A Little bit different population and a little bit different age. And in the end, what you end up with is the involuntary servitude, debt bondage, and or slavery. Sex slavery in the United States is the number two business, followed only right now by drugs, running drugs. But if intelligent people have soon learned that it's easier and less risky to run people in a car than it is to run drugs. Very simple. People don't stop and question. My family is every race, every age, every color. People should be stopping me all the time and saying, prove you own those kids. Or why are you traveling with a group of teenagers? My children are ages, you know, 27 to 12, okay? And we travel in three carloads when we have to go places. I could be a really good pimp if you looked at all of us and know we don't really belong together. We're your typical, put together, glued together family of beautiful people. And yet, we're never questioned because people look at us and go, oh, they must all be together. Look, they all got out of the same vehicle. Make sense? That's how they look, and that's how we as Iowans look around and we notice. And we don't take note because we notice they all, it's like, this is how our world looks. Okay? People will say to me, is it a choice, Ruth? How come these young men and women don't run away? They're making the choice to stay. I've even had people in my audiences say, say, oh, I saw them. They were on this screen and they didn't run away. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. Stop and think about what would stop you. What would stop you from leaving a situation that you're not okay with? What would stop you? Because if I'm a good recruiter and I've known everything that I can know about you, I know what you love and I know what will stop you, and I will have passed that on to the person I sold you to if, if the pimp is separate from the recruiter, which is typical in most organizations. So, why they don't run away? They don't run away because they're scared. They're scared of what will happen to them because there are, there are abuses that can happen to the human body that may or may not be seen. But they also worry about what might happen to somebody else. So in a good organization, you have the people, if I am the pimp, I have the person, my right-hand person, that I trust the most, probably who has been with me the most or who I promised the most to. That's the one I'm going to abuse because it's that person's job to befriend all of the people in my stable. Make sense? So their job is to befriend everybody else and then out of loyalty from all those others to this person, if I beat this person, I'm controlling all of them. So this is the one I'm going to tattoo. This is the one I'm going to put, put a gun to their head or a knife to them. I'm going to burn them. I'm going to torture them. I'm going to make sure, because I'm not selling that person near as often as I'm selling the rest of the stable. So if this one can't go back out on the streets again for another two or three weeks because they need to heal from the fact that I brutalized them, that's okay. They're here to take care of me and to make sure all of them stay compliant. Make sense? Yes? Okay. They live with strangers. People might choose to live with strangers, and we know that a lot of times traffickers will offer their beds, their couches, their homes, and, they'll, and people might start or they'll barter for called survival sex. And so we know that that goes on. We know that kids coming out of the foster care and adoption arena typically spend at least one night homeless in the first year that they age out of the system. We know that statistically that's correct. We know that they use survival sex because they can barter their body and they might not have that job yet to pay for that. Survival sex is a choice. It's when you don't have the choice or you are coerced into doing more than that that it takes it away. So people will say, what's the difference between prostitution and trafficking? Because those kids that are being trafficked, they're just prostitutes. First off, I don't believe in just prostitution or just prostitutes, just like I don't believe in escort services or just escorts or just strippers. There are people who do that job by choice. They are, there are, okay? They're out there and it funds their lifestyle and they're okay with it. That's their decision. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the ones who 
I choose to sell. So if I choose to sell me, that's my decision and that's prostitution. But if I choose to sell one of you and I collect that money, I'm trafficking. If you don't have a say in who, where, when, you're being trafficked. And if I'm saying you have a debt to me, so you owe me, you give me this, you need to pay me back, and every day your debt gets higher and higher and higher because I fed you yesterday and I fed you again today, and even though I got you a Happy Meal, okay, I'm going to charge you $200 for it on your debt, which is very, very common in the industry. They call it inflation. Okay? So when you think about it, it might happen very easily, but it doesn't take very long till you are vulnerable to the very industry that you are now washed into. Okay? You might choose to trade labor, you might choose to trade sex, you might choose to trade. As long as it's you trading, you're not in trafficking. But the minute you are forced, fraud, coerced, or traded in, and that doesn't come to you, you're trafficking. I frequently get asked this in Iowa, so I'm going to cover some information because we don't have our own task force yet in Iowa. And every single year since Brittany and I started this, we go to, the, go to our state legislators and we beg for a human trafficking task force. I would like it to be the same men and women who are trained in our child abuse task forces and our drug task forces because they're linked so closely together and those officers know what they're doing. So we went over to Omaha because they have a task force and we got this information from them. So the reason we don't have numbers in Iowa is very, very simple. Our state government does not, our state police officers do not have to report to our county or to our cities or to our feds and vice versa. The chains do not have to talk. Can they talk? You bet. Do they have to? No. So they might be investigating over here in this city but the state doesn't know that that's going on. So you've got two different investigations going, or maybe these people don't know at all what's happening over here, and it deters the numbers. The other thing in Iowa that deters numbers is that until this year, and we're hoping this gets passed and that the governor signs it, it was a misdemeanor to sell a human being, and it's a felony to sell a drug. So that marijuana that might be on your person will get you a felony charge, but you could be selling somebody's child, and that's only a misdemeanor. Okay, our laws are a little bit backwards. So that's why our numbers are off. So what our officers have done is because they know this other is going on, they do the drug charge because they want the felony. Make sense? They're trying, they're using every resource they can use, but that's how we can do it. So what we do know from the Omaha Task Force, between January of 10 and October of 14, there were 70 plus victims and many with open cases right now. We can only talk about the cases that are closed. If it is an open case, we can't discuss it because you all might be part of the investigation. Depends on who, where, when stuff's being talked about. You understand that a lot of these people that are being trafficked are in multiple locations, multiple states, and have had multiple buyers that have used them. Any and all of them could be part of this investigation, so thus we can't talk about them. We can say that the ages 13 to 40, there's a mean age, two were male out of Omaha, and the age is getting younger and younger and younger. I work for Youth and Shelter Services in Ames, Iowa. We have an AMP Council here in Dubuque, okay? Every single AMP Council that we have in the state, and I have 16 councils, and I have another 20 locations that I go to, I have survivors. I have survivors of human trafficking here in Dubuque. It's here. And they'll talk about it coming out of, you know, the, out the middle schools that they get recruited in, or somebody trying to date them from the high school, and they'll be dating this guy, and then all at once he'll want to say, well, you know what, you want to keep going out but you need to date this person over here because he'll pay you. He'll give you 20 bucks if you do this with him. And it's almost like that boyfriend, girlfriend, and then trading their sweethearts around, and that's how they're being hooked in, and it's here as well. Okay, we know that young single moms are targeted because they tend to have needs and high needs. Diapers are expensive, formula's expensive. Um, 
of rent is expensive. And so if you can hook that person in, pretend to be their boyfriend or their girlfriend, their lover, you can get that person involved and you get two for the price of one. There is no bottom age. The youngest person I know that has been trafficked was three months. Three months, baby, okay? But there are people in the world that are, that are into having, having issues, having relationships with babies and they think that that's an okay thing to do. The oldest person that I got to interview that had been trafficked was 71 when she came out of it. So if you are alive, you are in the age group that could be targeted and could be trafficked, okay? We know that they recruit directly from strip clubs, massage parlors, all of those known businesses, but they also recruit out of restaurants. They also recruit people that are waiting at tables. They could be sitting at a table and say to the beautiful waiter or waitress, hey, you want a job that's gonna make you more money than this? I could get you $300 a night. I could do this, I could do that. And it looks really good. And I've had a lot of young men and women fall for that, and pretty soon they're being trafficked because they quit their job. They told their parents they're still working at Burger King, but they're not at Burger King. They leave to go to work. They do the, the, the tricks that they have to do, and they go back home, and they're being trafficked right straight out of their parental homes. They're never leaving home. They're missing supper with their families, but they're sleeping every single night in their parental home. We know that the two most common times for trafficking um, is right after school, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., before parents get home and are watching again. And we know between midnight and 4 a.m. is another time that traffickers target and pull youth out to do, to do the work that they need to do, okay? We know that happening in the business communities, those that are being corporate one run, Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings are their most common times for the girls to be used or the boys to be used. And they come in with their businessmen in their suits and ties and the businessmen say, I just needed a break. I had to be with my wife and kids all weekend and I can't stand it. So they have a meeting at the office, but they're really using our trafficking, our trafficked youth. We hear about it all the time. Secondary victims are the ones that, that, are, that are, as the board says, you know, that are typically being used, okay? And what they do with those babies, if they're not using the babies as a victim, they use the babies as a leverage. You wanna see this child? You go do that work, or I'll take care of the child while you go do this service. Make sense? So it's kind of like that coercion happening all over again. I know that I had a pimp that I got to interview up in Minneapolis, and he said he really liked it when he got his girls pregnant. His reasoning was twofold. One, people want to have sex with pregnant women. It's an alternative thing, it's kind of cool, and people pay more money for it. The other reason was that baby, once it's born, and yep, it's his baby, he's the baby daddy, okay? But it gave clout to him to say, you know what? I'm gonna place this baby in the arms and care of my mother you're going to give me six days at $3,000 a day that you have to bring home to me, and then you can go spend three hours with your baby. See the leverage? And he bragged about it. Granted, he was in prison, but he bragged. Bottom line is, what would you do? What would you do to provide for your kids? And a lot of times, that's what these people are up against. Perpetrators the pimps. From the Omaha Task Force, this is not nationwide. We had the ages 19 to 42. They came from all social classes. One was a retired MBA star. He decided to get out of MBA. It was hard on his joints, you know, but he decided to run a trafficking ring instead. Okay, half of them are female, and I don't want you to miss that. When you start thinking about things that go on, if you were born and raised in this industry, you know this industry, you know how to make it work. If you're the bottom girl, if you're working for a pimp and you're the bottom, okay, that's a position of honor. That's the one that's trusted to run the money and run the numbers and keep everybody in line. That's the one you target. That's the one the pimp will, will have as their main girl, so to speak. But that's also the one that takes a lot of the abuse but they learn the business so they can recreate it. So even if they get away from their pimp, they can recreate the business. And there's where that line gets blurred when the police are involved to knowing, is this the one 
Do we charge her? Is she a victim or is she a perpetrator? I mean, which one, which charge do we go with? Because she's been in both roles. Make sense? It's an, it's an issue in our legislature now. Okay? Some of these other points I've already covered so that you know that they're there. Here are four cases that are closed up in the state of Iowa, just so you know. Imogene, Iowa. Anybody know where that's at? It's not even an incorporated town anymore. There were that few people, but the victims traveled with a trucker, okay? Some of the trucking industry, and I'm not gonna target truck drivers, don't take me wrong, there's some really good ones out there, and we currently have Truckers Against Trafficking that's doing phenomenal work educating truck drivers, okay? So I'm not targeting them, but their population, that's, that's one of them that sees a lot of this. But they, I've had a truck, truck driver who literally gutted the back of his semi he wasn't running any goods and services at all. He had people in the back of his semi in little cubicles where they could serve people. They just went truck to stop to truck stop to truck stop. His wife and kids were at home thinking he was running for this company or working for this company and he always had cash. He was providing for his family, but he was running a trafficking business out of the back of his truck. That's how he did it. Imogene, Iowa, Denison, victims located in a strip club by the parents had advertised and advertised and advertised. Kids kidnapped, they ran out of the Omaha area, okay? And they were found in the Denison, Iowa area in a strip club. And one of the strippers that was older that was in the business said, you guys look really young. They'd been there about three months before finally one of them cracked and said, I just can't do this anymore. And she reported she was an underage minor and they, there, there was the bust, okay? Osceola, make porn images of youth ages 18 months to 17 years. Okay, this is a huge issue. Pornography is directly connected into this. They warn me when I put out any information, if it's a picture of a scared female, young, or a scared male, that is, that's enticement to some of these people who like that feeling. So when I told you early on, we have to be so careful about what we're doing and what we're saying, because it could be a turn on to somebody in the audience because they like the idea that they're creating fear or hurt or pain in somebody else's life. And they, they, they enjoy that. That's part of the excitement. Um, case, statewide cases with remote pimps and cash cards. That's another one people in Iowa don't understand. But if I'm, if I'm in a stable and my pimp is in Texas, and I am told what my quota is, and that pimp has something on me that keeps me going, I have a circuit route that I have to go to, and I have certain hotels that I'm gonna stop at, and they are all prearranged, and they will know my schedule three to five days out, and they advertise, you know, Candy will be in Dubuque, Iowa on April 2nd, and then she will be in da-da-da-da-da, and the next night, and the next night, and they let those dates be scheduled. Well, the pimp does, or their organization does, all the checking of anybody that wants to buy that person. And they go to Wal Walgreens or Walmart or wherever, and they buy a gift card, okay? And depending on the service that gets prearranged and the price set, with each and every buyer, okay, they get that gift card, then they're given the location of where I'm going to be. And I get my hotel room, and I wait, and I know I've got three dates tonight, and the times that they're there, the person comes to the door, they give me their gift card. I use my little iPad and my little square, and I zip that card across, and it comes up $150, and those are the services that I'm to provide. That card gets immediately drained. It's then, give the card back to them, and I, and I do the services. And I am managed and controlled in that way, shape, or form. And there's usually some leverage that's happening all over the place. We can track those. The Attorney General has an intern, and that's all he's doing this semester is tracking all these different things happening all over Iowa. What we don't know is the location of the hotel, or you could go bust them. So our hotel industry is part of the problem. We've got to have people step forward in the hotel industry and say, you know what, if you've got somebody coming in and all at once they're doing two and three and four visitors at different hours, we've got a problem, and we don't know if that person is free or not. Okay, the lies that people buy into, very simple. That the victim knew what they were getting into. If the recruiter and the pimp have done their job well, they do not. Modeling, I'll give you modeling money, I'll give you money to do hair, I'll give you money to do people's nails. 
I will pay you to wait tables. I will do this, I will do this. Recently had a business in Ames, and it's being investigated, so I can't give you the name of the business. But every girl that ever went there came out and said the owner wanted to have sex with everybody that ever worked where. This business has been on that college campus since I was in school, and I'm, I'm old. And I'm thinking, nobody ever talked till they got trained in human trafficking, and they now know what that person's doing. Complete investigation going on. If it's there, it's here. It's the same type of thinking. When the owners don't have the, the scruples to say, no, people get to say who and when. And just because I employed you doesn't mean I own you. Okay? The victims paid for their services. They might be handed the money, but there's usually a runner outside the door that they have to give that money back to or a business that they have to slide that card through. They don't get to keep that money. Victim had freedom of movement. Looks like it, unless you understand the vulnerability that I already talked to you about and how they coerce you and threaten you to keep you there. Opportunities to ex escape, looks like it. And that's one of the things that when we get all done here today, I'm gonna challenge you. It's one of the things I want you to teach the people that you love. If they escape, how do they escape? And how do they get back to you? And do they wanna come back to you? Are you that kind of friend? Are you that brother? Are you that sister? Are you that parent? Are you the one they want to come home to? Because you want to make sure you're that person. Because you want them to come home. Trafficking involves crossing borders. It does not. I've already explained to you that we have kids that are being trafficked right out of their parental homes. They're not runaways. They haven't escaped. They're not missing children. Even though we have 300,000 missing children in the United States every single day, we believe about 100,000 of, of them are in the sex industry at any given point. We see pictures of them that we know we're tracking at all different ages, and we know they're in this industry. But if we can't get to them or find them in the location that they're at, we've missed them. We just know they're out there. And it can't be trafficking if the trafficker and the victims are married or related. We know that that's a lie. Happening in uh, uh, Dubuque here, what, a year ago in April, there was a case, um, and this one slipped through our fingers, but there was a woman that was working with a homeless family, and all at once the dad had $200 in his hand. And the person working with them said, where'd you get the $200? And he said, somebody offered to spend two hours with my daughter. The daughter was eight. Family trafficking is usually where it starts. I got, a, I got to interview a different pimp in Minneapolis when I was up there doing some work and this gentleman said he did never wanted his daughters trafficked never but his daughters had some of the most beautiful friends on the planet and how he got his stable is when his daughters were little and they started inviting friends over to spend the night he started grooming those little girls that were spending the night at his house with his daughters and he would touch them and he would see how they'd react and if they liked his touch he would try a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more till pretty soon he was having full-fledged relations with them with the daughter's friends while the daughters were sleeping the daughters were clueless the friends felt betrayed but they were part of this act and they thought this was common and they grew up and became part of his stable he bragged about it it was so easy he never had to steal anybody. Everybody loved him. He was the best dad on the block. And he, he said that he claimed about 14 of his stable members that way, that he raised up to do that. After visiting with him, my daughters no longer spend the night with their friends. Yeah, I don't even know how, how to protect them other than to say, people do this, anybody touches you. It's a you're screaming and your mother is coming because I don't know how else to do it when I know that there are people who are older and more planful, and that's their plan, that's a long-term plan to start recruiting when they're in elementary school because you want them when they're 13 and 14, okay? There is no safety. I don't want you to think there's any safety. I don't want you to think that you're not gonna ever be targeted. It can happen. People go to bars. They talk about how they went to bars and they left somebody behind because he or she found somebody they might want to go out with or they might want to spend time with. You don't know who that person is. We know that our, I, I'm not going to pick on our military people, but one of the ways that I know that people get to other people is they get dressed up in business suits 
or military uniforms or police uniforms or firemen's, and they pretend to be a career they're not. And it gives you a false sense of safety because you think you're among heroes, and I am among heroes, but you think you're among heroes, so you drop that sense of, of suspicion, and all at once that person might not be exactly what they say they're going to be. And they're doing things to you or taking you places, photographing you, taking you into environments where all at once you don't just have one person you're dating, you're in a room and you're expected to perform for 12. Two weeks ago, I was in Wisconsin. Two people on the panel, true story, college students. These are educated, beautiful, gifted young women. One was a track star. And I can't give you her name because I'm violating her to tell her story. So the bottom line is she needed $3,000 to pay the rest of her tuition to University of, of Milwaukee. She was at Marquette. Um, she wanted to be a lawyer, okay? She needed $3,000. Somebody offered her, if you will come to this party and you will serve drinks, you will be a hostess. All you have to do is take the champagne around to people. That isn't what she had to do, and she realized that after she got in the door, she put her stuff down. She, she was back in the serving area where they were, she thought, kitchen area, and she realized she was one of the people being served. And then she knew what she had to do to get out of there alive. She got her $3,000. It just took years to get it, because once in, she wasn't let out. And it was the coercion, it was the threats, it's the, I'm going to ruin you, I'm going to tell your coach, I'm going to tell your people, I'm going to tell these people, and you're going to be ruined, you'll never be a lawyer. Look what you've done. Another young woman came from California, also on the same panel, came from California. Her dad was a minister, her mom was, a, was an executive. She was drop-dead gorgeous woman. And um, she wanted to go into missions work and, and minister, the minister um, background, and she had had all of this in her world, and she, she was just glowing. Yep, they hooked her in by telling her she was going on a missions trip, and she was going to go to the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, and she was going to help build houses. Well, they took her to Tennessee. She never saw a house. She didn't get to build anything, but um, there was a whole lot done to her. And again, years later, she got out of the business with enough pride to say, I'm speaking out now. Both of those were college women before they started. These aren't uneducated people. These aren't homeless people. These aren't people coming into this industry that deserve our pity, or our sympathy. They're targeted individuals into somebody stable who are coerced and threatened. There is no safety. Anybody can be targeted. It doesn't just happen to runaways. It's not in just small towns. It's all over the place. Youth cannot be in this if they're not taken. I've already covered that. They're safe at schools. They're not safe at schools. Good pimp is going to take that phone that you give your child that you think keeps them safe. They're going to take that pimp, that phone, switch it out for the phone that, that only the pimp calls on or only the dates come in texted on and they're going to have that young person answering two phones, and that one phone from that pimp is never going to leave that youth's hand. If you as a parent ever take that phone, and I don't know if you all do this, because there are so many parents in the world that are gutless, and they're like, oh, my youth gets so mad. I couldn't care how mad your youth gets. We need parents in this country, and we need parents in this state that say, give me your phone. If you're not proud of who your friends are, then by all means, I'll keep your phone. They don't need contact with you. But your phones, your friend should have a first name and a last name. Better get an address. You ought to be able to tell me who that friend is at any given point. If I say, I want to know who Joey is, show me a picture of Joey. Show me a picture of this person. Or they're not your friend, they're an acquaintance. Most of the girls that I've worked with, oh, Sparky's in there, and there's other names, and they're all this gibberish or whatever. They're code names because their real names aren't in there. Or they'll call them nicknames. Really? When I was in high school, my boys in our class had nicknames, but I still know who Brett and Brian and Dennis were, but they weren't in my phone. Of course, I'm old enough, we didn't have phones in high school, but you know how that goes. But they wouldn't have been in my phone by their nickname, and I sure would, if my mother asked me for a phone, I would have handed her a phone. It's one of the games. They don't go by their own names, they go by code names, and they're only names that those people know, and they mean certain things, 
and there, there, there are different terminologies that people have to use, okay? So anyone can be trafficked. I want to talk a little bit about terminology, but I know it's on another slide. The recurring theme, of course, is vulnerability. Age is a factor in this. The younger, the better. The more immature, the better. If you have a mental health diagnosis that they can use against you, they will. Don't think that that rules you out. That's actually a plus. Poverty, homelessness, want, impulsivity, those are all things that a good pimp can use to manage and manipulate you. So they target youth. They offer support, they offer relationships, they offer all kinds of things to, to lure you in to the environment. Okay, they approach youth anywhere parents aren't watching. I told you I was in the Ames area. That's my, my home, I live in Story City. Okay, one of the things that makes me break out in a sweat these days, you ever gone to a movie theater? Easiest place for a pimp in the world to recruit kids. You know how you do it? You watch which theater they walk into, and you know, you get your choice. You buy your little ticket, and you can go like eight choices, okay? All I want to do is scope out the ones that they might be interested in. They go and they sit within two or three rows of that, and they drop on every single conversation. People say things in movie theaters to the person sitting beside them. They think they can't be heard. You can learn all kinds of stuff about somebody, including usually where they live, who their family is, whatever, as they're chattering, because your defenses are down. And it then goes dark, and you can get closer, and you can ease, eavesdrop more. And parents tend to drive up, drop kids off, and then they come back and pick them up at the end. It's like it says pick up at 8.35 at our movie theater. You know what I mean? It's almost like a gift to parents. You've got an hour and a half of peace and quiet, and your short people are now at the theater where they're safe. They're not safe because the parents aren't watching, but somebody's watching, okay? The traffickers lure with attention until they have your trust. And as soon as you think that they're on your side, they've got you. And the young person's brain is not mature enough to think this is too good to be true. And by the way, young people, that we know brain maturity is near around age 28 right now. And as more research comes out, that might get later and later. I think my brain is pretty immature most of the time. And I'm way past 28, OK? To control the victims, they do stuff like this, mental and physical manipulations. They do tattooing, they do branding, they threaten families, pets, you name it. They misrepresent the laws. You're a prostitute, you'll get charged, this will ruin your life. No, 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 trafficking is not the same. They inflate debt, they move victims frequently. How many of you are, are directionally challenged? Okay, my challenge to you is become undirectionally challenged rapidly. Because if you ever get taken, you need to know landmarks, you need to know where, you need to know how to get where you need to get, you need to know what cities you're in, you need to be able to retrack as much as you can retrack. A good pimp will keep you dope during that time when they're moving you, or they'll move you only at night so that you get lost really quick in the dark. And they'll use that against you. But that's one of the things that I notice about the kids in the foster care system. They've been moved and shuffled around like a deck of cards. They don't pay attention. They don't pay attention. And that gives them, that gives traffickers and recruiters a heads up. Very, very dangerous. You need to know how to get where you need to go and where you're at when you're going there. GPS on your phone is great. But what did I tell you I took first if I was your pimp? Your phone. You, you don't get that. I get that. Okay, some use drugs, but not everybody uses drugs. Good businessmen, if I can sell the drug and the person, I get more money. So I don't want to use my drugs manipulating my people so that I only have one source of income. I want both. I'm greedy, that's why I'm in this business. By the way, the average pimp per human being that they're trafficking makes 150,000 tax-free dollars every single year. That's a pretty good income. How many of you make 150,000 a year tax-free income? Yeah, me either. And I've got a master's degree and 28 years in the field. I'm not even a third of that yet. Okay, so they isolate in language barriers. This does not mean just foreign languages. This doesn't mean if you get a minor in Spanish that you're gonna all at once be safe. You're not. The language barrier is like this. How many of you go fishing? When you go fishing, what do you take with you? A pole? How many take a fishing pole? 
Mm -hmm. Really? Worms? Bait? Tackle box? You're not talking about the same fishing I'm fishing. I'm talking about. And the code words are like that. Take any word you want to take, make it mean something totally different. So I had kids, literally had kids in my care. They were going fishing. And I, as a parent, were like, oh, you're going fishing. And they walked out of the house. I'm not kidding, two daughters. Walking out of the house, they were going fishing. And I did this. Wait a second, wait a second. Where are you going? They're like, we're going fishing. You don't have a fishing pole, a tackle box, and who's picking you up? Get in the house. And then the dude that was picking him up to go fishing, I went out and greeted him at the car to see if he wanted to take me fishing. <laughs> he didn't have a pole or a tackle box or bait either. He went fishing by himself. Language barriers. Yeah, he doesn't like me anymore. Keep victims uneducated of their rights. Very, very simple. If I tell you all lies and I keep you uneducated, I own you. Okay? Shame you. Either I shame you verbally, I shame you physically, I shame you in the pictures that I take of you, I threaten, I say I'm going to send them to grandma, I say I'm going to send them to your aunt and uncle, your cousins, your relatives, your college, whatever I can do to get to, get to you. Um, most traffickers, just like in gangs, offer love and family. If you offer your own kids love and family, they don't need to go find it on the streets. They don't need to find it anyplace else. They got it with you. And that's going to be a second challenge that I give you. Everybody that you love, you better be telling them how important they are, how special they are. Those of you who have younger brothers and sisters, I'll give you a challenge tonight. Text them. Call them. Tell them what they mean to you. Because if they get that message from you every single day, they don't need me to come recruit them. They got you that believes in them. So my lies mean nothing to them. You want to you stop pimps, you want to stop recruiters, you be that person for your people, okay? My son is in Texas, he's in the Air Force, okay? There's not a night goes by that he doesn't call one of his 17 siblings, and I do have 17 children, and tell them what they mean to him. Because he's heard this lecture and he's one of the heroes walking the planet every single day. You have to stop the financial dependency, and you have to stop their desperation. If they're getting what they need from you as the aunts, uncles, cousins, parents, siblings, they won't look for people like me on the outside coming in to offer them lies. This is on labor trafficking. I got two slides on labor trafficking. Very simple, very simple stuff. Same things. Watch out for the businesses that are fronts. That means when you walk into the front part of the business, there's lots of traffic out here, and you walk in and there's two people, and you're thinking, where are the people? Where are the Look at all the cars. Looks funny. If it looks funny or feels funny, it is funny. It's very common in restaurants, massage parlors, nail salons, hair salons, etc. These are where these people are hooked in, sold in. They bring them in from another country. There's a language barrier from another country, and they're there to do your nails, or they're there to do your, your hair, they're there to uh, do your laundry or whatever. Are they free? Or is somebody watching them, watching every word they say? If you go into one of these businesses and you get that uh oh feeling, like this isn't on the up and up, do not say to that person, are you being trafficked? Okay, and I'll tell you, and we say this in jest, but there are, there are some do-gooders in the world who do that. But when the person says, oh, oh no, 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 and then you turn and you leave, what does that person who's guarding them do to that? Do you see what I mean? You, they are now in extreme danger, and they might disappear forever. You do not do that, but I'll give you a number at the end of this presentation that you will call and say, I get this uh-oh feeling when I go into this business. And then you let our police force, our heroes, go fix it. Okay? Do the workers have freedom to come and go? Do they live and work in the same place? If this is a business you traffic your, or you, you frequent, you're going to notice some things. Is it the same people in there all the time? Do they smile? Do they look too young to be working behind the counter? This is in people's houses, too, with housekeepers, cleaning services, all of that kind of stuff, even in the hotels. You ever been in a hotel and walk through and you see the cleaning ladies and you think, man, they look young. 
everybody looks young to me these days, but some of them look really young. Okay, that's a red flag. Okay, does a person freely communicate with you on multiple subjects? Do they act like they know what's going on in the world? Are they tuned in? Do they have those connectedness? When, when you're having you know, them serve you, can you ask them questions like, what do you do for fun when you're not doing nails? You're really good at doing nails, or you're really good at doing hair. You're really good at your job. What do you do the rest of the time? How did you get so good at this? Who trained you to do this? How did you learn this skill? Where were you when you learned? Those are all safe questions. And if they can't answer them, that's a red flag. Because you know what? If you've learned a really good skill that you're good at, you can share that with anybody, okay? What made them choose the work? Are they paying off debts? Most of us that got, went to college had debts that we had to pay off. Are we pursuing our dreams? See how the questions lead you to answers that make you go, hmm. And these are your points for the parents, the community, the friends, the neighbors, all of that. So these are the challenge points that I promised you I would give you. Um, before I go into this, Britt, do you want to tell your story and share this? And then we're going to take this one step. We'll come back to that slide, and then we'll give you the phone number. My name is Brittany. I'm Ruth's daughter. Um, I just want to share a little bit of my story with you guys. Um, I was placed in a group care when I was 14 uh, due to some family problems. Um, shortly after being placed there, I ran away with another girl to Cedar Rapids. Um, we went to her parents' house, and uh, her dad tried getting us to do sexual things with men for drugs for him. Uh, I refused and left there. Um, while I was there, I went into hy V um, after I had left their house, went looking for some food because I hadn't eaten in a while. Uh, while I was in hy V, a man approached me, and we had a conversation, and he asked me if I wanted a modeling job to make some money, told me I was beautiful, um, all those things. And so I went with him. Um, he promised me food, shelter, money, all that stuff. Uh, when he took me to do my first so-called modeling job, it ended up being something completely different. Um, he wanted me to go up to this man's house and do sexual things with him for money for him. And when I refused, he locked his car door and took me to another house where he dropped me off at. And for that guy, we were still in Cedar Rapids at this time, he made me cook and clean for him, and I hid his drugs for him if the police ever came. After being there for a couple of weeks, two other men came, and a girl came with them, and they, I was supposed to go with them. When I refused, they beat me and forced me to go into their vehicle with them and took me to Chicago where they then left me at another house that was run down. There were people doing drugs there, a lot of things that I didn't really want to see when I was 14. And I stayed there for one night. The next morning, another man came and took me and another girl to again go do sexual things with another guy. I refused and that girl went and did the, whatever she did with him and she didn't return back to the vehicle. The guy took me then to a hotel where he left me uh, with a bunch of other people. There were lots of other girls there, um, a lot of different people involved in the trafficking ring. I was left in a room with one other girl. Um, after the first couple of days, they took pictures of me and naked and posted them on Craigslist and listed all the services that I was supposedly supposed to offer and gave me a cell phone that I had to answer when people would call. So I was there for about a month, uh, being forced to do things against my will. And then um, a police officer came, and he was undercover, and he posed as a buyer. And I got the phone call. Um, I didn't obviously know he was undercover until after he arrested me and took me to the police station, where he questioned me and found out how old I was and that I had ran away from the placement that I was in. He got a hold of my biological sister who was in Iowa and we met halfway at four o'clock in the morning and she took me back home and then I was placed in group care again and then I got placed with Ruth, which then I was adopted and then what she told goes from there.
shared this with you? Things that you need to know. They're all things that I've covered already. Know your youth, your children, your friends, your people. Know your people. Know their patterns. Be interested in their life. Know their test schedules. You be the one that asks, not strangers. You be the one that stalks them on Facebook. You be the one that keeps track, track of what they're doing, where they're doing it. And the minute they tell you it's none of your business, you've got a red flag. And you have the right to say, you know what? My job is to make sure that each and every one of you reach old age as healthy and happy as what you can, you can reach it. And I'm here because I care and I love you. And if they consider that controlling or overprotective, when they're about 25 to 28, they'll remember that's a gift as they hold their own child and they vow to protect that child the same way you taught them how to, what protection looks like as you protected them. I look at that, the more protective my kids think I am, the better I did my job. And as soon as they say I'm trying to control them, I actually give hugs and kisses for that word because I think it's that important. And I have yet to need to control my children. It's a gift. It's a parenting skill. It's something that you do because it matters that they are healthy, happy, home, and safe. Teach, and, teach them their value. To me, if I'm the pimp, their value is $150,000 a year, tax-free money. What are they to you? Are they worth more than that to you? Are they? Because if they are, you'd better be telling them that. Because otherwise, I can be using them and getting that. And you don't want that, usually. Protect them with education and attention. Teach them what it is. Teach them how they recruit. Teach them it's out there. Teach them it's not safe to drop people off and leave them unguarded or unsupervised. I drop people off in packs, and I pick people up in packs. And usually, if I have to drop them off in a pack, I stock the building they're in. I walk around. I park outside. I'm monitoring. Okay? I monitor. It's constant. It's just part of what I do now that I know. I look for things when I pull into Walmart, Target, Kmart, wherever I'm shopping. If it looks like somebody's living in their car, I might really just watch to see who comes back to that car. If I see something that doesn't look right or feel right to me, I take down the make and model of that car and the license plate number. And this is what I do with it. Right there. In trafficking information and referral hotline. If you've got a phone on you, I would ask you to put that number in your phone. 888-3737-888. Now let me tell you why that's important. That telephone number goes into Washington, D.C. to the Polaris Project, if any of you want to go on a website. Their website is phenomenal. Within five minutes of them getting the information from you that you think something suspicious is going on in a business or in a place that you are at, you call in that location, that information, that gets sent back to our Attorney General's office, our state police, our state patrol, and our FBI. And they dispatch people to that location to start investigating. If they start seeing a pattern, the same number comes up, the same car comes up, the same license plate number comes up, they know they've got a case. And that investigation starts. You might never know whose life you save. You might never know that you're the hero that went in and bought Brittany and brought her out. You might never know how you impacted, but you impacted because you cared enough to pay attention. And that's the challenge that I ask for people. Those are references that you can get to. Those are things. And here's the other challenge that I want to give you. With this conversation, and Britt and I are going to answer questions in just a few seconds, I want you to start, stop and think. It doesn't stop here. If you've got that feeling in the pit of your stomach, go do some research. Go look it up. Figure out what you can say. The Polaris Project. There's hundreds of websites out there that say, how do you talk to your kids? How do you talk to people that you think might be in this? I have yet to do one presentation in the state of Iowa, and I literally do four to five a week. I have yet to do one that I did not have a survivor come up to me or email me after. I have never had one where I did not get multiple telephone calls from people that say, I think this is happening in my neighborhood, in my home, on my watch, with my family, with my friends, with whatever. I've had teachers 
I've had every profession call, but I've had the most calls from teachers that say, how do I stop it? You stop it from education. Teach them how to get out. Teach them how to get safe. Teach them where their safe people are. Teach them they don't have to go. No matter who threatens me, I'm still safe, but my child doesn't have to leave my home in order to keep me safe. And that was a huge relief off the backs of my children as I say, I'm safe. They can threaten all they want. They cannot get to me. Watch everything you can watch on it. Every story from every survivor is different. So Brittany's story is one in thousands. There's books and books and books and movies and movies and documentaries and you name it. They're all over the place and everyone is just as legitimate as the next one. And everyone should give you some piece of information for you to think about, ponder, apply to you. And I just want to make sure that you know that all of those things, these are documentaries that I have watched. I don't list them all on there anymore because they don't fit. That would be another 15 slides, you know what I mean? But they're there. But this is the information that I want to make sure you have easily, easily accessible to you. Now, I've thrown an hour's worth of information at you. Britt's given you the, the outline of her story. Are there questions, things that we can do or offer to you that will help ease, ease that, that feeling in your stomach? Don't, don't everybody go at once. I get really confused. Go ahead. So let me, let me see. There is nothing that I would avoid, ever. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very basic. This, this body is this body. This elbow is just as private to me as you know other parts of my anatomy. So I call anatomy what it is. I say things like, is anything, anybody touching parts of your body that your swimsuit cover, if you're a more modest person than I am? Um, I ask questions, I open it right up. That, this is sacred. It only goes to the person you decide to share it with at the point when you decide to share it. If you've got somebody that you think is being risked, whatever, you can say, is there anything happening to your body right now that I need to know about? Are you in a safe place? What decisions are you making when you leave the home? You can, it's whatever your style is of questioning with that person. Just opening the conversation by asking it lets them know you're open to the conversation. And they may or may not tell you the first time but if your gut says something's happening, you stay. I'm an askable adult. There's nothing that you're gonna say that's gonna, gonna offend me. I need to hear whatever it is that you need to say to me. Okay. Are there things that anybody would ever be able to ask you or comfort you with, say to you, that give you comfort more so than other things? Not, not really? You know, one of the things that I'd say, you know, it, and, and I'd say this whether Britt was here or not, okay? She doesn't value her body the way I valued her body when she first, when we first learned that trafficking was part of her world. Make sense? So one of the things that I as a parent had to give her was that overprotectiveness so she would learn how perfect and valuable she was, that she's that valuable to me, that she's that precious because nobody gave her that till she got to me. Does that make sense? And so it was me saying, you're worth everything to me. You are, you're, you're mine. I will protect you with everything I have. There's nothing that I won't do for you. That kind of talk, and I know she looked at me like I was nuts for months, and then she started believing it. You know what I mean? And seven years later, she is just as absolutely protective of her as I am. And, and, and she surrounded herself with people like that. And I just keep thinking, just relaying their value, 
how they are to you, how you view them, that's, the, that's a huge gift, huge gift. Other questions? Okay, I know that Kim's got an announcement that you're making about something that's going on next door. Okay, thank you for your time and attention tonight. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany Duncan. I'm the president of an organization we have on campus called Spartan Nation Liberation Foundation. And we are an organization that is trying to raise awareness on the whole human trafficking issue. And we, are, we have a sign-up sheet if anyone wants to be involved. And we also take donations to help make like survivor packages or stuff like that. So thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Casey Klein, and on behalf of University of Dubuque, uh, this wonderful group of young adults, uh, Ms. Hilby, we can't thank you enough. I, org I work with an organization locally called Set Free. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We are in Dubuque for the same purpose. We want to educate, we want to advocate, and we want to uh, rescue those that can't rescue themselves in human trafficking. It is absolutely paramount that you listen to every word she said, every single word she said. The most important thing is be prepared. Remember to always be observant, document, report. You don't rescue. We have champions and heroes that do that. They do. Absolutely. So it's been a pleasure. Again, set free. We are on Facebook. We have information out front. We want you to stop by and say hello. We're very nice people. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, um, my name is Jesse Tapia. This is Trayvana, Jasmine, and Caitlin, and we actually took Professor Hilby's human trafficking class this semester. I actually had a speech written for you, but I didn't memorize it, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, <laughs> sorry. There's no easy way to say it or sugarcoat it for you, but human trafficking does exist. It exists in your neighbor's backyard. It exists downtown. It exists across the street. It just doesn't happen in our world, and just around the world. It happens here. As, and if that scares you, then good, it's supposed to. So we took up the challenge to create a human trafficking display for all of you to see today. And we would like to invite you to the unveiling of it at the Heritage Center, and it's at, actually in the gallery. And a lot of people ask us, why did you decide to take up this challenge? Um, like I said before, a lot of people tend to avoid the issue. We like to close our eyes or turn a cheek because human trafficking doesn't exist. Dubuque's too much of a nice town. Everybody knows everybody. It's impossible. No, it's not impossible. It's happening. And one of the big reasons why we, tr we tend to avoid it is because we're unaware and we're uneducated. So the information that Professor Hilby gave us this semester, we would like to share with you. And that's what our display is about. It gives different information on all different aspects of human trafficking, but there's because there's not just one type. And we hope that after tonight, when you guys walk out and go home, think about everything that you have learned and take action, because in order to stop this, it starts with us. Thank you. Thank you.